All right, and welcome to week two of the Valley Sports Telegram Weekly Roundup. I'm Marsha Rissar, along with Kenny Hodges, and just going to get right into this baby. Um, probably the biggest, let's say, elephant in the room for the week uh, was the route fire out in Castaic, and complicate that with what's looking to be maybe 10 straight days of 100 plus in in the valley and the surrounding areas. Um, as the week was going, we had, you know, Burbank districts that they were going to cancel outdoor sports in the city and they canceled most practices. Uh, we got into, you know, Wednesday, it looked like some games might get canceled. And as Thursday went on, uh, the vast majority of games were canceled. Um, first off, I mean, as a school, the athletic directors, their number one job is to look out for the health and safety of their kids. And, and they did that, you know, um, I don't care if it makes our job harder, but they, they took out, you know, they looked out for their kids. Because to me, that's something that kind of can easily get lost when it comes to high school sports is the idea that these are still kids. Um, we got 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds out there. And yes, while they might be well conditioned, uh, some of the conditions out there, it's hard to just do regular things outside as opposed to going out and hitting and running and, and all the things that comes with playing a game, especially like football. So, you know, kudos to, the, the coaches and staff members and uh, probably the CIF had some, you know, correspondence and, and kind of helped figure out what the best move, uh, my, the best moves were. And, and kudos to everyone looking out for the safety of the kids first. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a good, it was nice to see. It was nice to see that, you know, not saying that if you, if you chose to play, you weren't looking out for the safety of the kids, right. But, because the way the weather fluctuated in certain places, it was a lot easier to deal with the conditions than they were, like you said, in com combination with the route fire. It wasn't just the heat. Then you were talking about air quality issues in certain areas of the valley as well. So it was it was good to see that football and sports was put second and health and safety of the kids was on the main priority on the main front. And I know it had to be hard, and it was disappointing. It was disappointing for us as journalists who wanted to cover some of those games because there were some big games that we were really looking forward to. But at the end of the day, it's a game. And you can make up a game, but you don't want to see someone end up on the field or, or be compromised because you chose to play in conditions that were adverse to what, you know, how they should be. So. Yeah, kudos to everybody involved, and like I said, it's early in the season. We got plenty of football left, so if you gotta, if you gotta put one in the bank and and not play, then it's just what we have to do. And it couldn't have come in a more um, telling week. Uh, you know, Aguru Hills was honoring their their fallen player, yeah. uh, you know, ahead of their game. And, uh, you know, it's a reminder that, you know, again, these are, these are kids and, you know, how tough would it have been to lose one because they chose to play? Yeah. Um, you know, and you had emotional games throughout. Now, you know, the teams that did play, it was obviously a very calculated decision. None of them were rash. Yeah. I don't, you know, I would not venture in any way, shape, or form to try to say anything negative about the teams that played because, again, it was weighing where are we temperature wise, where are we, you know, air quality wise. Mm -hmm. um, and do both schools feel like it's safe enough to play? And, you know, again, kudos for them because the decision is what's best for these kids. And if it was best to play, they played. If it was best to, you know, stay, they stayed. Mm -hmm. um, but on that side, 
you know, the games that were held, we got a chance to see some Southern Section teams in action that we probably would not have. Um, and it, it kind of opened my eyes in terms of, you know, more what is out there. Um, we know the Southern Section has the reputation of being, you know, a football power, especially in Southern California. But some schools that don't usually get love in that sense kind of showed me some things. And I'm like, okay, there is definitely more here. Um, and we'll get into that when we when we cover a couple of the games. Um, but we'll jump out with some quick hits. Uh, North Hollywood is 3-0. I, I didn't have him pegged for that. Um, their running back, Jalen Burt, is averaging 159 rushing yards a game. And, and they weren't cupcakes. So put him out there and let him go. Um, Van Nuys is 0-2. And, you know, yeah, their second loss was against... North Hollywood and Jalen Burt. Um, but they they still have to show us exactly who they are. Um, we're still waiting. Yeah, and in terms of North Hollywood, they were a team that I had pegged in, in the preseason preview. You know, just based on the, some of the things they showed last season, if there was a continued progression with those young players who got a lot of time last year, and Jalen Burt was one of them, if the, if you continue that trajectory from last season into this one, it could be a big year for North Hollywood. They could be a team that maybe we were talking about winning a league title or a city championship who might be able to run their way, no pun intended, to one. And this kid has definitely been the bell cow for them this year. And like I said, 180 yards on 10 carries in this game. I mean, no matter who you're playing, you still gotta you still gotta run through people. Um, yeah. whether it's good competition or or not or competition that's a step below. And even if you're going against a competition competition that's a step below, that's what you want to see. You want to see a talented player go out there and say, Hey, the first guy's not bringing me down. <laughs> I'm I'm every time I touch the ball, it's gonna be 15, 20 yards. And that's what Jalen Bird has kind of done so far this year. So it's going to be exciting to kind of watch them going forward and see what they do in the league as they start to approach their league schedule. Yep. Um, and then another one that we're talking, you know, interesting coming up into league is Panorama. They're 3-0. Mm -hmm. um, they got West Adams coming up, and they're just demanding eyeballs. Yeah, you know, they're just telling telling people if you're not watching us, you're missing out. Yeah, um, and they, you know, it's not easy for them starting up, but there's gonna be, you know, some tests, and you know they go right into Canoga week one of the league, yeah. and that's gonna be an interesting matchup. Yeah, the thing that you you want to see from a team is if you have games on your schedule that you should win, how do you look in those games? And Panorama hasn't just looked okay. They've beat up on these teams in a way that a team that you would expect to be at the top of the league to handle competition that they're supposed to take care of. Uh, yeah, and they look every bit the part of a team that could challenge for a league title. And yeah, they probably got their eyes set on Canoga week one, uh, week one of league play when they when we kind of get into uh, the Valley Mission. But they've looked really good, and I'm in this. I'm starting to get excited about what the prospect are prospects are for this team going forward. Yeah, and then staying in Valley Mission, um, San Fernando's zero and three, but two of those losses are Palisades and Lakeside. And so those those don't tell us exactly where San Fernando is in terms of where they want to be. Yeah. Um, because we will touch on it 
when we get a little deeper in, but you know, you look at a team like Birmingham last year was 0 5, and then they stormed to an open division title in the city. So, you know, with an 0 3 San Fernando, what are they? Um, the big question for me is their loss to Chavez in week zero. Is that a, a blip, a week zero blip, or is that a sign of things to come? And I mean, the next two weeks are going to show us. And we'll look a little deeper as we go ahead. Yeah. Um, and then another one in terms of questions is is Taft. You know, what do their two losses mean? What what is it going to show us? Um, you know, they ran over a Van Nuys team that it was week one for them and week two for Taft. Yeah. And we saw what happened last week with Verdugo Hills in their first game against the team with a bone to pick. So, you know, the question remains with Taft is what are we going to see? And they get Diego Rivera coming up. And like I said, the, the, the question around Taft all season long will be how will they hold up against the schedule? It's, it's a brutal path that they, they've got to, uh, they've got to walk and have playing an entire schedule on the road, including your entire league run is going to be on the road. And I get Diamond, Diamond Lee was a team based on what they've done so far this year. I mean, they're top 20 ranked in the city section for a reason. <clears throat> they are more than capable of going out and giving you a game. And it's a tough situation to kind of go on the road against a team. You're going to get everybody's best shot because everybody's going to look at you and say, hey, they've got to be tired. They, they've been on the road. They've got to come travel to us. Let's go out there and try to run them over. So, like you said, with the book still out on who they are, but they're going to want to start putting wins together before they get in the league. Like I said, they September 30th, they've got Birmingham right out of the gate. <laughs> they're at Birmingham right away. And matter of fact, I think they have Birmingham and Cleveland as their first two league games. They're going to want to be a feel a little better about themselves as they kind of go into that league slate. So it's going to be interesting. Diego Rivera is a game that they should win. Point, point blank, flat out. That's not, you're not going into Palisades. You can win that game. Are they going to be competitive or are the leg, the road legs starting to catch up to them a little bit? Yeah. And I mean, you can't, we, you can't emphasize that enough. It's not easy to travel every single Friday. You know, there's something to be said about knowing when you, when the clock hits, you know, one, two o'clock and you're mentally preparing for that game and you know, okay. You know, when we do our pregame meeting, we're going to be in our house. When we start getting ready, we're going to be in our house. There is no bus ride. Mm -hmm. um, but everything for TAP this year is is, is a bus ride. Yeah. Um, and it, it's all questions. And, and I've got more questions as we go. Um, our lead is 0-3. Now, you know, week zero was Granada. Okay. All right. I can I can give you give you that because of what Granada's done. Um but this week they were tied seven seven. And the wheels seemed to fall off against Marquez. They're not stringing together enough offense to get things going. And it looks to me like the defense just got tired and that was it. And then boom, big play after big play. Mm -hmm. you know, um, where are they going to find the consistency? You know, we've established they're working in a quarterback or two. And we saw two against Granada. Um, the running game doesn't seem to have the consistency it's had in the past. So who is our leader going to be? Who? The most difficult thing sometimes about high school football can be from a one year to the next, you can completely lose the identity that you have built, have formulated that 
brought you a lot of success and then you have a bunch of you have a bunch of leadership graduate and move on to other other things in life and now you've got to kind of reinvent that wheel all over again and what we've seen so far early in the year from our leader is they are losing games the way we kind of got used to or accustomed to them winning games last year yeah. which was punch you in the mouth run the ball run it again and when you get tired we run it some more and they would wear teams down by the time you got to the second half now they break a run or two put the game away and they just beat teams up physically they don't appear to have that ability so far earlier in the year maybe they can build to that and it's it's been a slow process and they just haven't been able to find it on offense but they just can't like you said, that game was 7-7, seven, seven, and then the wheels kind of fell off in the fourth quarter because, quite frankly, last year they dominated time of possession. Their defense wasn't tired last year. The defense got to watch them have six-minute drives on a regular basis because they would just run teams into the ground. They don't have that ability this year, so where are you going to find your offense from? And they haven't been able to find it. They've scored 14 points in three games. They found the end zone twice. In 12 quarters of play, they found the end zone twice. Um, I, I don't know where the offense is going to come from, but they've got to find it quick because things aren't going to get easier, uh, especially once you get into league play where there's even where there's even more familiarity with what you want to do. So, I mean, we're reaching levels now with our leader of, you know, we're approaching DEFCON 5 because – it's really hard to figure things out on the fly, and it feels like that's what they're having to do, and it's not working for them, to say the least. And, I mean, you know, we're getting in that moment. They kick off league with North Hollywood. So what are they going to do? You know, Jalen Burt is going to come into town, and you got to contain him. And, and what do you think the formula for that game is going to be for them? Let's get up two scores. We're going to run the football. If they can't move the ball down the field, if we can we can be back on a bus in a in two hours because yeah. we're just going to run we're just going to run it down their throat. They can't score on us. They can't move it. Get a lead and let's run this clock and let's get out of here. Let's, let's keep let's keep our injuries to a minimum. They can't move the ball. Hey Jalen, go get us a couple of touchdowns. Go get us a buck fifty and we're going to be on the bus and go. We're going to be out of here. You know. So that's that's kind of where we are with our leader in terms of teams are going to figure out fairly quickly, get up on them early, and they can't move the ball on us. They can't play from behind. Uh, yeah, I, I feel for them. Uh, there's, there's still talent there, but sometimes you just it, – it's a rough go when you have to replace players who were such an integral part of what you've done. Having to replace talent sometimes is – it's tough in college, in in high school football, and I mean, and that's across the board. You know, even even when you look in, you know, some southern section schools, they 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 got they've got the benefit of some looser um, regulations. Um, city sections really strict, but yeah. even then, you know, you look at a team like St. Jen, they're zero and two. And they got Palisades coming in. And and this is a team that, you know, who are we? And did they did they bring in enough homegrown talent? Yeah. Do they do they have any transfers coming in that are gonna make some noise? Um and Palisades is a city team that has some big designs this year. So what's going to happen yeah yeah and that's the and that's the thing about st jen's is it's tough being a a southern section team located where they are you you kind of don't have the benefit of have like you said having the, the ability to bring players in the way some of these other southern section schools can not to say that there's not a lot of talent on the team like i said i saw them in the preseason i watched them scrimmage against kennedy there's talent there. They've got a big, rugged offensive line. They 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 got some size up front. 
I think ultimately they'll be okay. They're going to be better than what they may have shown the first couple of weeks. But this is a big one, like you said, coming up against a team like Palisades, who they're going to want to notch a win in their. They're going to want to put a notch in their belt or the Southern Section win, just because that's going to make it look better for them trying to be a top seed in the open division. So St. Jane is going to have to kind of find the consistency they need. They've struggled on offense, quite frankly, the first two games. And they're going to have to find some offense because Palisades, while they might not be a Southern section team, they've got players on there that look like Southern section players. That's for sure. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do this week, St. Jens. This is another one. Um, A theme I'll get into later is I do feel like this week coming up with teams having lost the game last week, and now going closer and closer to the league. This is kind of a watershed week coming up. And St. Jens is definitely one of those teams. They're going to want to put their first win on the board this week. Yeah. Talking about you know, wanting to have put that first win on, um, I'm going to roll right into one of our, our gems for the week. Uh, it was Birmingham and Chaminade. Um, and and this was this was a, a rough experience um but a learning experience um you know coach said they had 15 players out with covid so to everybody who wasn't paying attention covid is still a thing it is um and and the quarterback you know tisdale he he had covid before the week prior um then after the game, and he tested negative and was able to play. But they managed his reps because he wasn't able to practice. He wasn't able to be around the team. So they managed his reps in the first half. Um, and and Shamana did what they were supposed to do. And you're coming in against a team that is fielding multiple underclassmen, and you're supposed to run them out of the building. And, I mean, they... Basically did that for the first half. Um, Tisdale played the entire second half and kind of was a calming just influence, which is interesting to say because the kid's a sophomore. Yeah. But he came in, he took control of the offense in the second half and you know kept the game that could have been 60-something or nothing. Kept it under forty. Yeah. You know, he had, they had that one big offensive drive. They had a chance to get in and and maybe score. Um, they turned the ball over, but still, the big positive, you know, is the sophomore calmed the team down, let them down the field, and marched. And all those underclassmen at Birmingham. They got valuable experience. You can only get it playing in games. So moving forward, that's that's good for them. Um, and again, kudos to Shamanan. They they came in and did what they were supposed to do. Um, and that's I mean, taking care of business is big. Yeah. Um, and 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 I'll just add when you talk about Birmingham. One of their hallmarks the last few years is they stack that non-conference schedule. And one of the pitfalls in, in this new reality we live in where COVID is still a thing, you may have a week where you're playing a tough opponent, but you you just don't have all hands on deck, which, like you said, now causes uh, or forces younger players to be in roles against a tough team and kind of have to figure some things out. And you know what? In the long run, it'll it's going to serve Birmingham to Birmingham's benefit to now have a roster full of kids who have had to wait their turn. And then when their number was called, you know what? It was a tough game against a tough opponent, but they got that experience. They they got those live reps, and it's going to serve to their benefit as they go forward because the hardest thing in football is okay, someone's Someone went down. All right, who next man up? That next man up mentality is something that's preached, but you have to have the ability. You have to have the kids who can, can kind of do it. So, yeah, it was a it was a tough it was a tough week, 
it was a tough loss, but that experience that was gained can be invaluable for them going forward. Um, and exactly, you know, you you use it to rebound. You know, look at look at what you were able to do when you, when you watch film. This is what we did, and this is how we move forward with it. Um, and it it gets me looking at at the other gym we had, uh, Grant and Southgate. Grant was coming off a heartbreak against Cleveland. Right? You go watch the film. What do we do? Where do we grow? Um, they were in the game. It was seven to six at halftime. And, you know, Southgate had the ball to start and they held him to a field goal. So 10 to six, let's make something happen. Um, the very next drive, Grant fumbled. And Southgate did what you're supposed to do. You know, they made him pay. But what gets me is it was a 55-yard rush. Yeah. Come in, make a stop. Um, you know, where are their heads? Are the, are the kids in their heads? Um, you know, and, and I asked that question because 17-6, to 6, okay. And then they get stopped, fourth down, you got a punt. And this is the second straight week where a punt is either net zero or one negative yards. And you gave your opponent, who has momentum, a very short field. And again, Southgate capitalized, and I was 24 to 6. Um, so, okay, come on. Make something happen. And again, just like last week, they fought, grab, battled, and they marched the field. They got inside the 20, inside the 10, and then they fumbled. Um, kudos to the defense fighting it out, but you got to protect the ball. You got to protect the ball. Um, and again, Southgate made them pay. The mark of a good team, <clears throat> and I, it's something I said last week, and it's something I will say often. The mark of a good team is do we beat ourselves? What separates teams when you're splitting hairs, look at the New England Patriots did it for years. When you would see them play, yeah, Tom Brady, the GOAT. But what you would often not see the Patriots do is turn the ball over, give other teams short fields. Sometimes football can be as simple as that. You have to keep yourself in a game by finishing drives and at a bare minimum, not breaking your own back with turnovers, with silly mistakes, uh, with losing your fundamentals. You have to be able to keep your wits about you when things start to slide a bit. And that appears to be an Achilles heel for Grant so far. What we're seeing is that when things start to go the other way, can you dig your heels in and keep that ball from rolling over you? And this is two straight weeks where it's felt like the comp, the damn kind of broke on them a bit with their own mistakes or just lack of discipline in moments where you need it. And that's what will take them when, if they can clean those things up, that's what will take the Lancers from being just a team that might make some noise to a team that could potentially maybe win a city title. Because the talent is there. You've seen it. You've been there. You've seen them. That's They are a talented bunch. But you can't win games when you're turning the ball over inside the 10. You can't win games when you, you're not being disciplined and hitting through a guy's hips and you're letting a guy break a tackle and now he's off to the races. Those things will break your back in terms of trying to win a game and will make a scoreline look like you weren't in a game because you see how it kind of got away at the end to like, no, that's not the case at all. We were right there and three or four mistakes that we don't make take us from looking like we got blown out to maybe we win this game. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we, we say it here at the high school level, but that's at all levels of football. You know, you, you clean up one, two, three mistakes, and you go from you know losing thirty-eight to six to 
you know, maybe a couple of those drives, you get points. You know, definitely inside the 10. Okay, if you don't get a touchdown, you get a field goal, you get some points. But now you're looking at something that's probably, you know, 18-15, 21-18. You know, a game where you can look back and be like, no, we were in and we fought and we did what we were supposed to do. Yeah. You know? And that just leads me right into, you know, Village in Canoga. Canoga Park is clearly in a rebuilding phase. Um, they had less than 25 kids on the sideline for Friday. Um, it it hurts me to see it because back when I was more involved. And Canoga was a part of the Sunset Six. They were the team to beat. You would circle Canoga and say, we need to go through them if we want a league title. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're, they're a proud program. You know, they, they made noise last year. And so to come in this year and you've got less than 25 kids, in you know week two that that hurts um there's some experience but they're young and you know and it shows and when you go up against a village team on the flip side that lost their starting quarterback he transferred out Mm -hmm. and now you're going to turn the reins over to a freshman They didn't lose much more after that. You know, players stayed and they rallied. Um, and it could be the difference between a southern section school and a city section school, you know, where the players chose to stay. Um, but still, you know, you had just a team that came together and, and is playing pretty good football, you know. Um, and the freshman, Chase Everett, he showed pretty early, you know, that he was legit. I mean, the first score of the game was a 67 yard pass catch and run, but he, he put it in there pretty good. Um, and then his, the other two scoring, well, scoring passes, there was a 71 yarder and a 30, 35. So, yeah, he's got the ability to put the ball in there. They've got people that have the ability to, you know, make players miss. Um, but you look at it, they did what they were supposed to do. Undermanned on, you know, on the other side. And you just take care of business. They spread the ball out. And... Did what they were supposed to do, yeah. and and to, and to touch on um, Everett a little bit, mm-hmm. he when you watch his when you watch his film from these first three starts, there's I get excited because I see him. He's you know a slightly undersized for the position. He's like 5'10", 150, but he's a freshman. He'll fill out a bit over the course of the next couple of years. But you see something in this kid with his poise that reminds me a little bit of the. Uh, Noah Fatita, uh, uh, Fatita, the kid who was the Servac quarterback last year. Same sort of build, little undersized for the position, but a leader. You could see it. You see the way he can he commands his offense. You see the way he commands the huddle. Uh, it's rare to see a freshman under center who can come off of their first read <laughs> and, and find guys open. He can go through his progressions get the ball to guys, get the ball to his playmakers, and look like he's been doing this like he's a senior, like he's been doing this the entire time. And he has gotten off to a great start this year. I think he's got something like eight touchdown passes and like one one interception. He's got a rushing touchdown. He does not look like a freshman at all when you see him play. Uh, and, and sometimes that makes the difference. If you – talent is talent. And if you can start at the varsity level and play that way, yeah. Uh, Village Christian could be a team that people are going to have to deal with this year and 
years going forward. And, you know, right back on there, you know, Coach was saying um, he, Chase, decided, you know, he was going to be a part of the program. He was going to play, um, you know, when he was in sixth grade at the middle school level. And he started to put in the work, you know. And when you've put in the work and you're in the system and you've got people around you who are playmakers and you've got people around you who are going to help you kind of grow into that spot mm-hmm. and you command respect, then you're going to come out and do that. You know, you're going to come out and you're going to throw for, where is it? 342 yards. Yeah. You know, you're going to do that. And he had a near perfect passer rating, but for the second week in a row. So this is a kid that I think is going to open a lot of eyes. This is someone who's going to start making waves as they get in, you know, towards their league. And they have a tough league now. You know, they're in a new league. And there's going to be some crazy travel. And there's going to be some challenging teams, but they have the opportunity to make some noise. Yeah. Um, and and that leads us into making noise. El Cone Calabasas. El Camino isn't necessarily where we thought they might be, um, but Calabasas is making noise. Um, And you were there, and so just take us through it. So uh, the initial thought going into the game is, like touching on what you said, Elko's not where we thought they would be uh, so far this year. They haven't looked the part of a team that's really going to give the top-end teams trouble in the West Valley. But nonetheless, this was an interesting test. Um, just to kind of see how they could handle a, a team like Calabasas who call a spade a spade. They've got some they've got some serious D1 prospects on that team. Everyone knows about Aaron Burns. He's one of the better players in in the state, let alone this section of the country. He's got offers everywhere. Um, U.S. You know, I think he's an early commit to USC, so you expected him to do big things in this game. What was surprising about Calabasas is it's more than just him. They they've got weaponry everywhere, and Elko did their best to try to stay in the game. But when you've got guys like like Aaron Burns, and when you've got Jerry McGee, uh. Uh, an experienced receiver on the other side who can catch the ball and who can catch the ball and and take it to the house at any given time. Then if they want to pound the ball at you, they've got this monster of a running back in King Miller who can make you miss in a phone booth, but also can run you over if he needs to as well. And you kind of saw that talent sort of begin to overwhelm El Camino a bit. Uh, El Camino has a talented quarterback, Javon Hall. He is he is he is talented, but when things aren't going right around him, it's a little difficult for him to be able to keep the offense on track. He did make one really big play in the game. He had a 71-yard touchdown pass and it was a beautiful pass over the top. Got outside the pocket, let it go. It was a perfect, perfect dime right over the top of the defense. But that was about it. That was it. That was about it for Elko's offense for that entire game. And I would say is it doesn't denigrate El Camino all that much that they weren't able to hang into the game because, like I said, Calabasas looked the part of a team that's going to make some noise in the southern section will come playoff time and in league. But you just want to see them continue to fight. And you want to see them continue to progress because as they get in the league, these a game like this will serve them well because they did show fight at times. Uh, they had a couple of drives they sustained, but they just couldn't uh, uh, drop pass here or there, and they just couldn't stay in the ball game. Um, they had one curious decision early in the first half, but I think it was almost out of desperation of not wanting to give Calabasas the ball back where they were 
it was like fourth and 10. They were pinned it deep in their own end and they went for it when I thought they should have punted the ball away. But that wouldn't have been <laughs> uh, a, a safe option as well because Aaron Burns was on the verge of taking back three different punts for touchdowns uh, during that game. So it would they, they were overwhelmed a bit with uh, Calabasas' offense. And the Calabasas played well in all three phases of the game. The defense played well. Uh, they had a a missed field goal return for a touchdown. So they it, it was a thumping in all three phases. But I will say for for El Camino, you take the you take the lessons from this game, which are you got to remain disciplined. You got to you got to remain focused in times when you need to kind of dial in to keep drives going and hopefully they'll take this and they'll grow from it. And as far as Calabasas is concerned, they look really well, but one of their big issues this season and it reared his ugly head in their close loss the previous week at Oak Park is they get penalized a lot and they've got to get that cleaned up um, because it will cost them when they play against tougher teams, when they get into their Southern section part or portion of the schedule, but they look good. And I'm excited to see what they do going forward as well uh, because they definitely have some kids that are going to make some noise. They're going to make noise this year. They're going to make noise on the next level when they get there as well. So those are my big takeaways from that game. Um, and that kind of leads us into, into our players of the week. Um, and we didn't have too many to keep an eye on. A couple of blowouts, limited. Um, you know, looks at some others. But, I mean, we still had Jalen Bird at North Hollywood putting up 183 yards and three touchdowns. You know, he got 10 touches. And so that tells me he's going to do it and he's going to make it happen every time he touches the ball. And and they protected him if he only got the ball 10 times. Um. And Chase Everett you know, opened my eyes. And you know, 342 yards, three touchdowns. And that was all in the first half. Everything else was on the ground. Um, and it makes sense. You know, it was a 63 to nothing blowout. You don't need to pass the ball. You don't need to do it. He did it all in the first half. Yeah. Um, again, we were limited in. A lot of the players we could have seen or wanted to see. Um, but it only makes the coming weeks bigger for me. Um, you know, looking ahead, we've got quite a few big names and games this very next week. Um, and then the week after, we start getting into some league action. And... If if you ask me, a lot of questions are going to start getting answered in two weeks. I'm calling for me personally. I'm calling next week a watershed moment for quite a few teams. Um, like you said, we we see the tr- struggle that Canoga has had. It's not going to get any easier when they go against Cleveland. I'm we just look. You you really want to see the team put in a fight because, like I said, we we're, we're quickly approaching getting in the league play. You want to see them at least turn in the corner to be competitive. And plus, you have other teams like Taft, like we talked about earlier. They got a game against Diego Rivera, um, El Camino coming off of this loss. They've got San Fernando. Um, some of these games to me will be important because how they play going into league, going into league could affect teams like Birmingham or Cleveland or Granada Hill, some of those teams in their league that have designs of being higher seeds when come playoff time. Well, if El Camino and Taft aren't holding up their end of the bargain, uh, those won't look like quality wins when it comes down to a committee deciding who gets seeded where. If the ultimate goal is to try to get your playoff run mostly at home, you need to have quality wins on your schedule. And for those games to feel like quality wins, we're going to need El Camino and Taft. If, if you're Birmingham or Granada Hills and Cleveland, you're going to or Chatsworth even, you're going to want Taft and El Camino to kind of come back to the pack a bit um, better than what they've looked so far. And and 
even a team like Panorama have started three and zero. They come out of this game. Um, I believe they play. They play West Adams next week. You go on the road to West Adams and you beat them up. Now you could be looking at. I think they probably. I would say they probably still look like a Division three uh, playoff team. But maybe the year, maybe you start looking like a, a team that could be a top two or three seed in in Division three and get your playoff games at home as well. So there's definitely some watershed games coming up this week that will tell us some things that we want to know about teams who have struggled a bit. Can they turn it around going into league play? Or are they going to, or is this just going to be a rough season for some of these teams? Well, also, um, you know, some teams that have surprised us a little bit are going to have a chance to tell us, you know, this is their last big test before league. You know, um, Pauly gets Eagle Rock. Mm-hmm. And that's one that I saw, and I immediately it was like, that's interesting. That's yeah. going to answer some questions for Pauly because they've played tough. What are they going to do there? Um, you know, Monroe and Trinity. That's a Southern section matchup for Monroe. And they're not taking it easy. So that's going to, you know, say something coming out. So not just for teams that have been losing and are looking to kind of get back on track going into league and try to see if they can solidify something moving forward for the playoffs. But teams that have won, what are you bringing this week? How are you getting ready for league? Because um, to, to piggyback really quickly, like mm-hmm. we had, we talked about Grant. Uh, it's Grant's got a game, an interesting game this week coming as well, because coming out of how you played this game, you're going to want to play well this week. And on the surface, you see Silmar come in and you're saying, okay, this, this could be a week we get it back on track. Silmar just blew out viewpoint this weekend. There's, so there's no guarantee that this is a pushover coming in. You make a lot of the same mistakes you made this week against Southgate, you could find yourself in a real battle against Silmar this week, who's who's going to feel pretty good about themselves coming in this week as well. So, yeah, there, there are some real tough tests and some questions that could be answered about some teams. Like I said, we were high on Grant because of what we saw talent-wise, but this could also be a bit of a trap game week too if you're not ready to play. Yeah. You know, and there's the schedule's littered with it, you know, when you look at it. So it's it's gonna be an exciting week. Um, you know, week three is gonna bring some serious action and and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, because we got one big one on the schedule that I've had circled for two weeks and I need the heat to go away and not mess with this game uh, because it's going to tell us a lot about these two individual, these two teams. And well, what will now be Granada's opener? They've got Kennedy coming in. So again, two teams that will know a little bit more about what their plans are and what they could be depending on how they look against each other. So um, it's going to be an exciting week. That it is. Um, And so to everybody, good luck, good week, and we'll see you all next week.